For the next video in our Day in the Life series, we're going to travel back in time to the 13th century where the spectre of heresy loomed large over all the regions of Europe. But especially in the Languedoc area of what is now southwest France. Why was the Catholic Church so threatened by a group of celibate vegetarians? What were their beliefs? How were they connected to our old friends the Knights Templars? And what led to their tragic and shockingly violent end? Before we get into today's video, I'd like to take a moment to give a shout out to History Hit for working with us on our channel. We honestly can't say enough good things about them, but if you've been living in the Middle Ages and somehow don't know who they are yet, History Hit is an incredible platform similar to Netflix, but jam-packed with documentaries, podcasts and articles about all your favourite historical eras. Their award-winning podcast network includes gems like Gone Medieval and Dan Snow's History Hit and their online history channel has hundreds of hours of original history documentaries. It's okay, dear viewer, I consider me and you in an open relationship. You can go check out History Hit as well as watching our channel too. All of this is brought to you by Expert Historians, with 19 new podcast episodes and two new programs being released every single week. When you sign up, you can download the app onto your phone so you can watch anywhere, anytime, on any device, like your smart TV, tablet, or your phone. Recently, I've had to take some long train trips, so I've used the time to catch up on some of the documentaries that I missed. Speaking of, if you're a fan of this channel, you have to check out Dr. Eleanor Yaniger's documentary called Exploring the Medieval Afterlife. As medieval history nerds, we love the depth of knowledge that she brings to a fascinating subject, understanding what people were afraid of and how that shaped society. But there's one thing you absolutely shouldn't be afraid of, and that's subscribing to History Hit. They've actually brought us all a very special discount. The code HISTORYHIT will get you a whopping 60% off your first six months. This means you can subscribe to History Hit for less than £3 a month. That's less than a coffee from Starbucks, and you'll get way more enjoyment out of this subscription. We promise. Click the link in the subscription box below to find out more, and subscribe to History Hit. And now for today's video. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Heresy. It was hardly a new concept. As soon as the Catholic Church became the authority on what was acceptable Christian policy, there were many isolated heretical groups that did not conform. In 1215, Pope Innocent III made decrees to standardise Christian beliefs across the whole of Western Europe, so that everyone from king to farmhand was worshipping God in exactly the same way, from London to Lisbon. The Catholic Church had total control over every aspect of the medieval's lives, and they remained the dominant power by condemning, converting or killing anyone with religious beliefs outside of their own. But it was the Cathars that were the most troublesome for the Vatican because they had considerable support. Beliefs Not much is known about where they came from, but the Cathars appeared during the 11th century in the Languedoc area in the territory of Occitani. This was not part of France at that time, but rather a separate province having a different language, which still exists today. The Cathars also flourished in other parts of Europe, including northern Italy. They were sometimes called Albigensians due to the city of Albi being thought of as their headquarters. Cathars were dualists. They believed in two twin yet conflicting deities. One good god of light, kind and loving who had created the spiritual realm, and one bad god of darkness who was evil and had created the material world with all its suffering. It was this malicious god who kept souls imprisoned inside their physical bodies. This meant that the world was in a constant state of struggle because of the two forces. Essentially, Catharism was an endeavour to try and find out why there was evil in the world. Cathars rejected the Holy Trinity, but venerated Jesus as a spiritual and benevolent angel, following the teachings of the New Testament as the model for their lives. But they rejected the humanity of Jesus and his mother, the Virgin Mary, believing them to be pure spirits. Considering the resurrection an evil idea, and the cross a representation of torture and wickedness. In fact, everything in this material world was deemed evil, and the Cathars worked hard to free themselves of it. How else could the horrible calamities and sufferings of the world be explained, if there was only one benevolent god? Daily Life much like any other people who lived in the High Middle Ages, the Cathars went about their work dependent upon their position and jobs within the community. 
The farmers farmed, the bakers baked, and the blacksmiths blacksmithed. Having children was a problem for the Cathars. They thought it was wrong to bring forth any more souls to be trapped in the material realm, so they never married, shunning sexual intercourse and preferring to remain celibate. At mealtimes, the Cathars ate a pescatarian diet. Meat, eggs, cheese, milk, and even animal fat, which was used in a lot of medieval cookery, were not allowed because they came from warm-blooded animals which were thought to carry reincarnated souls. The killing of any animal life, except for fish, was not allowed. Fish were thought to arise spontaneously from inanimate matter, a popular belief in the Middle Ages. Any free time was spent praying regularly and practicing self-examination and discipline. Prayers had set hours and were practiced 15 times each day. They were held in private houses as there were no churches. Cathars led good lives, referring to themselves as good men, good women, and good Christians. They shunned wealth, power, sex, and the establishment. All money and property was renounced except for the habit they wore and a Bible. By all accounts, the Cathars appeared to be the complete antithesis of the church, not caring about creating any notoriety or a following. Equal Rights Those who wanted to remain as pure as possible by adhering to a very strict life were known as the Perfecti. Much like a Catholic priest, they would live a humble celibate life, teaching the New Testament and tending to the people in their communities. They performed a ritual called Consolamentum, whereby they raised a person to be the level of Perfecti just before death, so they could ascend into heaven. It was the Cathar equivalent of the Last Rites. One fundamental difference between priests and perfecti was that women were also accepted to preach and teach. It is thought that about 50% of perfecti were female. In fact, women were regarded as being just as important as men because the spirit had no gender. This would have made Catharism seem particularly attractive to women who were banned from almost all positions of authority within the Catholic Church. In time, the movement had gained a serious following in the Languedo, and the Cathar Church was divided up into four dioceses, each with its own bishop in the cities of Albi, Carasson, Eijen, and Toulouse. Enemies of the State For the Pope, these beliefs were fundamental to the Cathars' alleged heresy. Not only did the Cathars preach about mercy, morality, and tolerance, but they did actually live within those values. Believing that the church was hypocritical, an institution based on fear, power, and greed, they were quite vocal about their contempt for the church and everything that it stood for. The Catholic Church believed that God is a complete supreme being. God created everything heaven and earth, and everything that is seen and unseen. From birth, the medievals were taught about the sheer horror of hell and what awaited them there. And the only way to get into heaven was if the Roman Catholic Church let them in. But the Cathars didn't even believe in hell and the fact that they did not recognize the state-sanctioned clergy was also a problem. It didn't help that the religion seemed to be quite widespread amongst the nobility in the Languedo region, and even those who were of the Catholic persuasion turned a blind eye to the Cathars. After all, they were good, peaceful people, and well-liked. So the church began to fear them, and it was never a good idea to make an enemy of the Vatican. The Cathar Crusade at first, Pope Innocent sent a number of papal legates and preachers into the Languedoc, hoping to achieve a peaceful solution by converting the locals back to Catholicism. Viscount Raymond Roger VI, Count of Toulouse, was one of the most powerful noblemen in the region. Although he was not a Cathar himself, he was sympathetic to their cause. Raymond refused to help the Pope, and was excommunicated in 1207. The Pope wrote and told him that, quote, we will enjoin all the neighbouring princes to rise up against you as an enemy of Christ. In 1208, Pope Innocent sent his senior legit and inquisitor, Pierre of Castellanor, to oversee his Cistercian preachers. But, confronted with the unwavering Cathars, who had respect of the local people and the nobles to protect them, the plan for conversion was unsuccessful. On the 13th of January 1208, Raymond met Pierre, but talks broke down, and a day later, Pierre was murdered by an unknown assailant. And although there was no evidence, the finger was most definitely pointed at Raymond as the murderer. Just like the death of Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, which was the catalyst that launched the First World War, then the assassination of Pierre seemed to have been the spark that ignited the Cathar Crusade. Enraged, Pope Innocent turned to the great nobles of northern France to rise up. He appealed to the good and faithful people of Christendom to expel Raymond, his supporters, and the whole heretical Cathar community from their lands. 
He even promised any Crusaders a get out of jail free card from Purgatory if they died during the mission, declaring that, quote, Heresy needs to be uprooted once and for all. The prospect of land and wealth attract many willing participants to the cause. You may hear the Crusade referred to as the Albigensian Crusade. This is because the city of Albi was in the center of the geographical area being discussed. By the summer of 1209, about 10,000 Crusaders had assembled in Lyon to begin their march south. That's where our old friends the Knights Templar get a mention. There are stories that the Templars refuse to join in the fight against the heretics because they sympathize with the Cathar cause, and there are even reports of them offering shelter to the Albigenses. But it may just be that the Templars refuse to get involved because they never got drawn into any of the Pope's wars, always choosing to only fight the Saracens in the Holy Lands. By the 21st of July, the Papal army had reached the outskirts of the town Bézier, and started a siege of the city. They were commanded by the Cistercian abbot of Cito, Arnold Amalric. The Catholics of the town were told to come out, and the Cathars were instructed to surrender. When neither group complied, the abbot was reported to have shouted, quote, Kill them all! God will know his own! During the bloody massacre, it is thought that up to 20,000 people were slaughtered, regardless of age, sex, or religious belief. No one was spared. Those who sought refuge in the churches were put to the sword, even the priests. Then Bézier was sacked and burned. William of Tudela wrote an epic poem in the language of Old Occitan in 1213 called The Song of the Albigensian Crusade. He describes the bloodbath at Bézier as, quote, So much sorrow that left so many dead with their guts spilled out, and so many great ladies and pretty girls naked and cold, stripped of gown and cloak. Persecution. News of the butchery soon spread. Many other towns in the region were evacuated, some surrendered without a fight. After Carcassonne was taken on August the 7th, Simon de Montfort, a prominent French nobleman, was chosen as the leader of the Crusader army, and many other towns quickly fell. At last tour, 140 Cathars who refused to recant and return to Catholicism were burned at the stake. Some walked into the flames voluntarily. The crusade continued, it officially ended 20 years later in 1229, but persecutions continued after this time. In 1244, after a nine-month siege at the Cathar stronghold of Montségur Castle by French forces, the people surrendered. Sentenced to burn, about 210 Cathars spent two weeks praying and fasting before they voluntarily walked out of the castle and onto the burning pyre. Genocide Hunted by the Inquisition, tortured and subjected to heresy trials, many Cathars were killed long after the Crusade officially ended. Historians believe that up to one million Cathars have been executed over the centuries. The Catholic Church said that the Cathar Crusade was about heresy. It ushered in a dark period for medieval Europe, a time of Inquisition and fear, when many people were tortured and executed for their religious beliefs for centuries after. The Roman poet Lucretius summed it up well when he said, quote, Such are the heights of wickedness to which men are driven in the name of religion. Thanks again to History Hit for working with our channel and giving us the chance to share our love of history with you. So remember, use our code HISTORYHIT to get 50% off your next three months. What are you waiting for? Go subscribe today. I'll see you next week for another video. Cheers.